So I'm uh, Maury Samuels, and uh, I'm director of the Yale Program for the Study of Antisemitism, one of the co-hosts of this conference with Steve Pitty. And it's my great pleasure uh, today to introduce our second keynote speaker, my colleague, Timothy Snyder. And I should say that we're incredibly grateful to Tim for uh, literally getting off a plane, I think, from Iceland uh, in order to come here today. So. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be very brief because I know we're, we're running late and you all want to hear Tim. So he's the Richard C. Levin Professor of History at Yale University and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. He received his doctorate from the University of Oxford in 1997, where he was a British Marshall Scholar, and he joined the Yale faculty in 2001. His work is distinguished by his command of languages. He speaks five and reads 10. And by the way, he integrates multiple national contexts into historical discussion and debate, particularly of the Holocaust. Among his publications are eight single authored, award-winning books, all of which have been translated into multiple languages. And in the interest of time, I'll just mention the last three. Bloodlands, Europe between Hitler and Stalin from 2010. Black Earth, the Holocaust as History and Warning from 2015. And most recently, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century, 2017, which has made it onto the New York Times bestseller list. Bloodlands won 12 awards, including the Emerson Prize in the Humanities and the Hannah Arendt Prize in Political Thought. It has been translated into 33 languages, was named to 12 Book of the Year lists, and was a bestseller in six countries. Tim is also the co-editor of two books, uh, Wall Around the West, State Borders and Immigration Controls in Europe and North America, and Stalin in Europe, Terror, War, and Domination. And he collaborated with Tony Judd on Thinking the 20th Century from 2012. In addition to this amazing outpouring of scholarly publishing, he has somehow found time to write for the New York Review of Books, Foreign Affairs, the Times Literary Supplement, The Nation, The New Republic, as well as for the New York Times, the International Herald Tribune, the Wall Street Journal, and other newspapers. He was the recipient of an inaugural Andrew Carnegie Fellowship in 2015 and received the Havel Foundation Prize the same year. Most recently, he was named a Guggenheim Fellow. He's a member of the Committee on Conscience of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, is the faculty advisor for the Fortunoff Collection of Holocaust Testimonies at Yale, and sits on the advisory councils of the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research and other organizations. The title of his keynote address today is On Tyranny. Please join me in welcoming Tim Snyder. Thank you very much, Maury. Uh, most of the lectures I've given in the last six months have been uh, to non-academic publics, which has convinced me all the more that space matters and physicality matters, which is to say, if you feel like moving closer, <laughs> you will, in fact, understand more of what I say, and we will, in fact, have a better conversation. I'm going to admire the first person who actually stands up and moves closer. That's going to be you, sir. All right. Thank you. Well done. There you go. Well done. Well done. Um, so I'm going to, be, I'm going to begin with, with, with two confessions. The first of them Maury has already made for me, which is that I did indeed just come back from Iceland, which means that I, I haven't heard the arguments that you've made unless you made them in the last 20 minutes. So I, I risk saying something that you have said worse. Um, I risk filling in gaps that, that, that aren't gaps. So all I can promise to you is, is a kind of general conceptual argument, which I hope will, you will find useful as you consider um, the specific claims that have been, our, have been, have been our, our topic the last couple of days. The second confession is I'm a historian. That's the second confession. So what I have to offer will have to, will have to be limited to the way that a historian might think about the present moment, which is something, as Maury was kind enough to suggest, I've been, I've been trying to do. So let me, start, let me start with Iceland. I'm going to take five minutes, and I'm going to work Iceland out of my system. And, and at the end of it, we'll all, we'll all be together, I think, on, on, the, same, on the same page. It is, it's very striking to spend 24 hours in a country 
which was, uh, which was set up by Vikings a thousand years ago, at the same time that one is trying to teach a class about how Vikings set up another country a thousand years ago. Is there anyone here who's actually in History 263 right now? No? Okay. Veterans? No? All right. Um, so I, the, the, the age of the Vikings is where I begin my East European history class. As, as, you will, as you will all remember, I'm giving you just a moment of, re of what is going to seem like recreation from your harsher subjects. As you'll remember, the age of the Vikings involved Scandinavians spreading out from what's now Ukraine to what's now Iceland and, and even further. And it's very odd for me as I, I one day to be teaching about Ukraine, the next day to be in Iceland, realizing that the same runes, the same languages are being used in the same place at the same time by, by pretty much the same people that the Vikings who got to Iceland and success, on their boats left those same runes on the Dnipro River um, to commemorate uh, Vikings who died trying to go down those, those, those southern rapids. It's, it's really striking to think that these, these pagans converted at about the same time, at about the year 1000. In, in Iceland, um, from the Norwegians, there was no choice. In Kiev, same Vikings, same people, but many, many choices. In Kiev, there are actually just Judaism and Islam about, and Christianity is visibly divided. So the fact that the Vikings in, in Kiev end up being Eastern Christians is, is, is in large measure a matter of chance. It's striking to, 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 to contrast the cultures um, that the Vikings or the post-Vikings, the, the, the Icelanders in the 13th and 14th centuries could write 40 sagas which frankly like beat the hell out of pretty much any comparable literature in Europe. It's an extraordinary thing. And then to compare that to what are already being built as the Byzantine, the Eastern Christian cathedrals and monasteries of, of Kiev. Again, similar starting points, but now we're branching out into very different cultures and to very different agricultures, which can seem like just chance or can seem like the center of everything, depending on how you're looking. If you, if, if you drive around Ag uh, uh, Iceland, what you see are volcanic mountains which were stripped by the human settlers and are still largely stripped. Only 1% of, Ice of Iceland is now forested, and that's a result of human settlement. And it's, we still have not recovered eight centuries, eight centuries on, whereas those Vikings who settled in Ukraine happened to find themselves amidst black earth, amidst some of the most fertile soil in the world, which is still some of the most fertile soil in the world. And so whereas the Vikings in Iceland scratched out an existence and prospered for a couple of centuries, the Vikings in, 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 in Kiev stopped selling slaves and instead started to exploit the labor of the people around them and built up a civilization which was known as Rus. These are the things that I was thinking driving around Iceland yesterday and flying back to Iceland today. I'm just barely scratching the surface of this thing which is called history. But what I want to try to suggest is that history is a way of processing events in the present, and it's a way which contrasts more clearly than it might seem with other ways that we might use the past. So while I'm in Iceland, I'm also hearing of a friend who just by chance as a child learned to write in runes, right, because that's the kind of person she happens to be, um, and has now stopped writing in runes because she's realized that American Nazis are making runes their favorite way of writing, right? Um, as I'm in Iceland, I'm also thinking of the history of ancient Rus, that settlement in Kiev um, by Vikings roughly a thousand years ago, which has become a highly racialized um, and, and highly abstract uh, imaginary beginning point of the history of, of Russia. There are ways of thinking about the past which I'm going to call the politics of eternity, which seem like they have to do with history. They, they invoke, they refer to points in the past, but they're not interested in the combinations, the comparisons, the chronologies, which I tried to suggest so briefly when I was talking about Iceland a, a moment ago. Of course, there's another way of thinking about the past, um, which is native to the United States of America and which is pretty widespread, and which I would call the, the politics of inevitability which says that there's no particular reason to know these details about the past at all, since we know what the present is going, we know what the future is going to be anyway, the details, the details cease to matter. Um, what I want to try to do in the next half an hour or so before, before we talk is to compare these ways of thinking about the past and suggest that, I like the word conjuncture, um, which, which I think Brendan used in the last, compare the ways that these thinking about the past arrive, arrive in, arise in our conjuncture and what they might mean for race, and what they might, and what they might mean for the way we think about the way we think about um, the way we think about community. We've come to think about community. Okay, so let me say a word about the politics of inevitability, 
then a word about the politics of eternity, and then at the very end I'll say something about, about this whole tyranny business. So by the politics of inevitability, I mean a certain kind of timescape, and, and this should start to sound familiar the more that I talk about it, because many of us live in it, at least some of the time. Um, I, would, I, would go so far, I would go so far as to say that most people in this country live in it most of the time. The politics, or at least they did until November of 2016. Um, the, the politics of inevitability says something like this. Um, time moves forward in a line, or maybe time is like a cone where things just get better as time moves on. Um, the present, uh, the present is, 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 is worse than the future than it's better than the past. We, we know which way things are going. Um, and, and it's the future, really, which confirms meaning on, confers meaning on the present, right? So if there's some kind of crisis in the present, that's fine because we know that it's the birth pangs of something or other. This way of seeing the, 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 the future, the present, the past, this way of experiencing time is something that unites systems that might seem to be different. It's true, for example, of both Leninism and um, what was called neoliberalism. Now, I'm going to promise only to use the word neoliberalism once in this presentation, which I think is a rule that we should all follow. Okay, so I've now used the word neoliberalism once. That's my one time. If I use it again, you can, you should, you can feel free to boo and hiss. So, um, so it, what, what, what Leninism would say would be something like this or just Marxism, that nature leads to technology, leads to conflict, which leads to revolution, which leads to some good thing, right? Neoliberalism might say something like nature leads to technology, which leads to competition, which leads to technical solutions, which leads to some, to some good thing, right? The stripped down American version would be nature means markets, means democracy, means, means we're all happy. So that's what, that's what the politics of inevitability looks like. What I want to suggest is that we were living in that. Um, we were living in that, many of us, uh, until, about 2000, until about 2016. Now, um, there, there, is, there is, of course, okay, there's also a European version, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but the, the, there's a European version which is really, which is really interesting and which is, which is just as wrong. Um, and how much I make fun of whom depends on which side of the Atlantic I, I am. So what's wrong, what's wrong with the American version? We know what's wrong with the American version. There's no point particularly dwelling on it. Um, we know that there's a contradiction in believing that markets automatically generate democracy. We just experimented that by allowing endless money into politics in 2006, right? Um, we, we know that the shock of the financial crisis of 2008 had ra rather significant consequences. And we're aware, I'm sure you've been discussing in various ways, and I'm going to return to it, the way that the resulting inequality affects democracy. Let me let me state let me pause for just a minute on the European version. So there's there's a there's an American politics of inequality. There's a, a politics of inevitability. There's also a European version, which is slightly you know as European things are, it's slightly more subtle. So it's going to take me it's going to take five, about 15 more seconds to explain it. The the the, the history of Europe, the story of the history of Europe. Um, in in the 19th and 20th centuries, the main drama of the history of the Europe is the transition from from empire to integration. Okay. That's it, history in the sense of what actually happened now is what I'm talking about. The transition from empire to integration. That's the main story of what actually happened. The, the, the accompanying myth or fairy tale is the story of the nation state. The nation state is there so that we don't see what actually happened, which is the big transition from empire to, to integration. The story that Europeans tell, which is cool and appealing and makes Americans feel guilty, is that there was, there was something called the Second World War. Europeans learned from the Second World War that war is bad. Europeans are smarter than Americans because Americans haven't learned that yet, right? That, and, and therefore European Union. That's the story. Now, the only thing, the only thing wrong with that story is everything. Um, <laughs> Europeans did not learn from the Second World War that war was a bad thing. European, if that, so, if think about that proposition just for a second, like we've heard it so many times that it's like second nature, but it's not, it, there's no, all the evidence is, is the other way. The Europeans who suffered most from the Second World War were in order, the Jews, the Belarusians, the Ukrainians, uh, the Poles, and the Russians. Please try to convince me that those people learned from the Second World War that war was a bad thing, right? Uh, you just, you cannot construct um, from a history of political theory in those countries the conclusion that pacifism arose, right? In, in Jewish, Polish, Ukrainian, Russian, and Belarusian political thought after the Second World War. Um, what actually happened is more subtle and more interesting, and it breaks the line between European and global history, and therefore has some chance of being true, and that is this. What actually happened is that Europeans learned 
from losing colonial wars that maybe wars were a bad thing. So what the Second World War is, is the transposition of colonial war inside Europe. The main action in the Second World War in Europe is the German invasion of the Soviet Union, which is a colonial war. The point of the German invasion of the Soviet Union is to destroy the Soviet Union and to control the aforementioned black earth of Ukraine. That is the colonial aim and it is the central aim of the German war on the Eastern Front, which is the front of the war that matters, right? And since the Germans are the ones who start the war, it's their aims that matter. So the German invasion of Soviet, the Soviet Union in 1941 is the last major European colonial offensive. It just so happens to take place inside Europe, which we find confusing, or some of us at least find confusing. The Germans, you know, I'll jump to 1945, you'll know how this ends, they lose the war. Now we tend to then, we tend to then bracket that into some kind of special experience of a Second World War, but it's not. That is in fact the first major European defeat in a colonial war, right? And it is followed by many others. The reasons why Germans begin the process of European integration first is that they are the first to lose, and in an incontrovertible and unappealable fashion, a colonial war. So they then begin a process of integration with their West European neighbors, which is then taken up by whom? By other European powers who are busy losing colonial wars, right? The, the Dutch, the Dutch, the French, the British, the, the Portuguese, the Spanish. What happens is that European powers, maritime empires, lose their maritime empires. And as they lose their maritime empires, they find a soft landing in Europe. The story that they tell themselves, and most importantly and tellingly and fatally their children, is that there was a nation the whole time, the English, the British, whatever, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and that nation chose, chose Europe. That's the fatal mistake. And that's the politics of inevitability, because it suggests that there was a nation the whole time, which there wasn't, and it also suggests that there was a nation state at some point in these countries' history. Now, that there was a nation state at some point in the history of Europe is an axiom which is so deeply felt and believed that, and I've tried this a number of times, you can shock pretty much any, I'm going to use the word elite once now, you can shock pretty much any elite European audience in any, in any circumstance by claiming that there was no European nation state in the modern period. But then as soon as, and the interesting thing is, as soon as they think about it for 15 seconds, they tend to agree, right? But the fact is that it's never called into question. The story that actually takes place is empires break up and join an integration process. But the story that's told in school is there was a nation the whole time, there was a nation state at some point, and the nation state made a decision. But here's the thing, the nation state never existed. And this is where, um, let's call it populism. This is where populism, I, like, I call it sadopopulism, but I'll go into why later. This is, this is where populism sees its weakness and makes its move. Because everybody thinks there was a nation state in the past, which means that populists can say, why don't we just go back to that nation state, right? Why don't, and, and no one, literally no one replies, because that never existed, you can't go back to it. So in this way, and this is the arc of an argument, a larger argument I'm trying to make, the politics of inevitability, the sense that things always go on and are heading towards some kind of better future, always opens the way to the politics of eternity. It, al it always has, there's always, a, there's, always um, there's always a gap in the shield. There's always an Achilles. There's always an Achilles heel. Now, um, okay, think about this. My glasses in there. So, um, the, the 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 particular way, um, and I'm sure you all have noticed this and perhaps talk about it. The particular way that the European politics of inevitability works is that it seeks after a nostalgia for for the 1930s. It's the 1930s where one imagines that there once was a European nation state. Um, in a fuzzy way, of course. And, and, and I think it's worth noting that the 1930s have become a kind of universal object of nostalgia. Okay, this brings me to the politics of eternity. Now, let me talk in a kind of abstract way about the relationship between the politics of inevitability, the idea that everything is going to go well, that we know the rules of history, that history is over because we know it's going to come, the relationship between that and the politics of eternity. Um, the timescape of the politics of eternity is different. It's about repetition. It's about cycles, right? It's about things that happen over and over and over again. And if you look hard, there's actually only one thing 
that ever happens over and over again. And the one thing that happens over and over again is that um, the perverted, aggressive outsider tries to penetrate the ineffable virtue of us. And that happens over and over and over again. And it's like the politics of inevitability that in that you don't have to know the details, right? You don't actually have to have any historical facts to recognize that pattern. That once you know that that's the pattern, that those are the cycles, it's pretty easy to interpret whatever anyone might happen to say in, in, in terms of that in terms of that pattern. So history is, a, is history is a kind of permanent is a kind of permanent siege. Now. The politics of eternity is also like the politics of inevitability in that the present doesn't have any meaning on its own, right? Now this for me is like the really interesting, let's not call it a paradox because that word is almost never truly applied, but let's call it irony. Um, it, this is the really interesting irony. When we say history, we think, we think okay, what well, we think, the past, irrelevant, you know, wins dinner. But, the, but, but in fact, it's only history that takes the present seriously. Other ways of thinking about the past are there to abolish the present. So um, if, you're, if, you're, if you believe in the politics of eternity, if you believe that what happens in the present has meaning with respect to some coming future, then the present doesn't really exist. If you believe in the politics of eternity, if you believe the same thing is happening over and over again, then again, the present, the present doesn't really exist. Um, likewise, the politics of inevitability and the politics of eternity do something similar, do something similar to the idea of reform. If you believe, you know, if you believe in the magic of markets or whatever, class conflict, if you believe in some mechanism of the politics of inevitability, you don't really need to care about reform, right? You don't have to contemplate seriously what reform would entail because better things are more or less going to come regardless of what you do. Likewise, if you believe in the politics of eternity, if you believe that history is a cycle, that the nation is constantly under siege, reform becomes unthinkable. Because how can you talk about reform when the, when the enemy is constantly at the gate? And if you take the same argument a little, one step further, you see that both of these ways of thinking do the same thing to the idea, an idea, an important idea, where is he, with which Mr. Seymour closed, the idea of responsibility. Because if we know the way things are going to turn out, then you don't have to bear responsibility. Likewise, if you know the, the, the cycle of history and you're in the middle of it, you don't have to bear responsibility. And you know, while, while we're on the subject, both of them do away with morality. Because if you know the good thing already, and the good thing is in the future, then whatever brings about, whatever hastens that good alternative is good. The politics of the attorney works the same way. You already know the bad thing. The bad thing is the enemy which is eternally encircling and who is always coming back. And thereby, by default, the definition of good is defending yourself and the community against the enemy. So there's no need to think about to think about what's good. So these my 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 point here is that these these forms of thinking about time, inevitability and eternity, right? You know, let, let's let's say if you want capitalism and socialism over here and uh, populism in the modern sense, right? I don't mean that I populism and fascism over here. They seem to be different. And they are, okay, they are. They are, of course, different. But in, in, one, in, some, in these particular respects, in the way that they handle time, there, there are some stri time, responsibility, morality. There are some striking similarities. And there, there, there are more than similarities. There's the particular ways in which one of them opens the way to the other one, which is what I, which is what I see and feel in our conjuncture now. I mean, what I see and feel is the politics of inevitability giving way to the politics of eternity. The politics of inevitability weakening, fissures opening, and the politics of eternity emerging and, and strengthening. A lot of the events that we observe and chronicle um, and, pay, and pay attention to, I think could be, could be, could be understood in, in these terms. Let me, let me give this a shot with Russia. Okay, so um, let me give this a shot with Russia. Now, I'm the last person who would say that the particularities of the rise of the Russian right or its influence on the United States are of no interest. Um, Anton Chikov sort of works on these things. They're fascinating. I've, I've learned from him. But what I want to try to suggest is that there's a pattern beneath these details and that the reason why Russia is so interesting or so important is that Russia is a pioneer in passing from the politics of inevitability to the politics of eternity. What is world historically unique about contemporary Russia is that it has made it, which means its population, its leaders, the people who have the wealth and the people who don't, have made this transition from inevitability to eternity twice in one lifetime. 
twice in one lifetime. In the 1970s, when communism in Russia ceased to be about the future and started to become about the past, which is a long story, but in the 1970s, Brezhnev says, so the whole story of communism, right, is that there's a future, right? I mean, this is the heartening story of communism. There's a future of justice where you can imagine man is going to return to his nature. In the 1970s, Brezhnev says, no, actually, I mean, you know, you can't quote Jack Nicholson because the movie hasn't come out yet, but Brezhnev basically says, this is as good as it gets. Um, he calls the, the, the radical inequality um, and the crankiness of 1970s Soviet socialism really existing socialism. So he basically he abolishes the future and communism. And instead, and this is clever and it's important um, for the future, instead he replaces that with a vision, with a nostalgic vision of the Second World War. Right? Now why is that important? Because it's a shift from the politics of inevitability to the politics of eternity. And it means that the West is the enemy for a different reason. The West is no longer a temporary enemy, which will be our friend in the future after the revolution. The West is now a permanent enemy because the West is always attacking Russia like it did in 1941. So that's the version of communism with which the present elite and population of, oh, I said elite twice, okay. The, which the, the present leadership and population of Russia was educated. I mean, for me, the 1970s is the crucial decade. That's time number one, right? And that's really interesting. I mean, just to know that Putin and Lukashenko came through that kind of education where you could be both Leninist and nostalgic is, I think, very important. But in addition to that, Russians passed through a moment of the 1990s when the politics of inevitability failed a second time, which was the failure of the capitalist version, right? Because it did not turn out, I'm making a short story short, it did not turn out that, um, that completely liberated markets brought about beautiful democratic institutions and happiness for everyone, right? That did not happen in Russia in, in the 1990s. And so both versions of the politics of inevitability for simplification, the communist one and the capitalist one failed in rapid succession in, in the mature lifetime of the same generation, the one, that's now, the one that's now in power. And this shift from um, inevitability to eternity also has a logic, which one can perhaps see is better in Russia, or let me put it this way, we can see it better in ourselves if we first look at Russia. Um, at least if we're American, because I mean, as is, Americans cannot look at themselves at all, that's a different story, but we, we have to look somewhere else to see ourselves. So the, the interesting thing about Russia is that you can see a mechanism by which the politics of inevitability gets, gives way to the politics of eternity in Russia, um, which, is precisely, which is precisely radical economic inequality. It's not, when I say that the capitalist politics of inevitability fails, that's really abstract, right? When I say that markets don't lead to democracy, we all know that that's the case. You know, we know that the elections in Russia are ritualized and faked and so on. But there's something deeper here, which is the way people feel about it. When people feel that they're doing worse off, or that only a few people are doing much better than they are, stories of progress no longer make sense. That happens in Russia just a tiny bit before it happens in the United States. And that's why you know, Russia makes this turn to the politics of, of eternity slightly before we do, right? Which, which I think you have to have in the background before you start talking about Russia and the United States, happy as I am to talk about that. Now, Russia is also the pioneer in extracting ideologies from the 1930s and bringing them back to us. Other people fool around in this. Steve Bannon fools around in this, the Poles fool around in this, the Hungarians fool around with this, Farage fools around with this, Marine Le Pen fools around with this, but the ones who have done it really seriously are the Russian leadership. Vladimir Putin is the only head of state, to my knowledge, in the 21st century who has actually taken a major fascist thinker of the 1930s and ensconced him as the state philosopher. The man's name is Ivan Ilin, and Ivan Ilin is, is an eternity politician par, par excellence. Okay, so that brings us, that brings us to, to, to Russia. Now, it's easy and cool and fun to talk about how um, Russia elected Donald Trump, which they did, right? I mean, the info war, the info war and the cyber war, which they were just practicing on Ukraine in 2014, when nobody was paying any attention, was then brought to a much higher level of perfection by the time they were working it out on us in 2016. Unfortunately for us, we had no sense that the story of Russia and Ukraine was about us. It was about exotic people who maybe spoke exotic languages, but we weren't sure which, right? But we knew it had something to do with runes. Um, we, the, 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 because we know this is really important. Because we saw the, the, the because we saw Ukraine entirely in terms of culture, 
right? And we saw it as a distant, exotic culture. If you're inside the politics of inevitability, you see these weird conflicts as a result of cultural backwardness. And you ask yourself questions like, oh, what language do they speak? Are there two Ukraines or are there one Ukraine? It must be all about their backward culture and that Cyrillic or whatever it is that they use, those runes, glagolitic, we're not sure. Um, so we, nobody in America, as a first approximation, I'll say nobody, nobody in America treated the events of Ukraine in 2014 as having anything to do with American politics. But they turned out to have everything to do with American politics. That, though, you know, that, that's half the story. Half the story is, is the techniques that Russia had already developed inside Russia to manage inequality, which were then applied to the US. But the other half of the story is our, is our vulnerability. The really critical thing, the really critical thing about the United States is the way that we become like Russia, right? The, the reason why Russian politics of eternity work in the United States is not just that they're smarter than we are, which they are, um, that they have more experience with the politics of eternity, which they do, that they have their cool fascist Hegelian philosophers, you know, which they do. That's all interesting. But the important thing is that our society, that's my American R, our society is coming to look like Russian society in terms of the disposition of wealth. And therefore, the reasons why people think that, 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 that politics, and this goes back to the last panel, that politics is nothing more than a cycle of things happen over and over again, is that they actually do not have the experience of social advance, and they don't believe their children are going to have it other, either. And when you don't have the experience of social advance, the story of the politics of inevitability, of progress, ceases to resonate, ceases to make sense. And so Russian propaganda may have been very clever, and it was, um, and they may have targeted it very well, which they did, but there was a big, fat, rich target in the United States, and the reason it was so big and rich and fat was because the United States looks more and more like, 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 like Russia. Okay, so in that way, you know, our timescape was bending, right? The politics of inevitability was bending. It was falling down and was starting to circle itself, right? Gravity makes things orbit. The gravity of poverty, the gravity of misery, it makes things orbit. We fall, we fall into a cycle, right? As the Russians have fallen into a cycle. The gravity of poverty, the, the, gravity, the gravity of misery. Okay, then Europe. So how does this apply to Europe? What's the politics of eternity in Europe in, in, in practice? It, it's, it's also the case that um, Russia has something to do with European dis disintegration. But it's the same story. They know what they're doing and they're applying techniques, but the reason why the techniques work is that the soft spot is real. In the case of Europe, um, the Russians support the Scottish referendum for independence. They support Brexit, although even they are surprised when that one turns out. Um, they, they support the far right in Germany. They fund Marine Le Pen's Front National. Um, they support elements of the extreme right as well as the extreme right, left pretty much, pretty much everywhere. They practice certain kinds of, of, of metapolitics, giving space to radical figures in, in, in their press. And they project a certain kind of idea of Europe. Um, where Europe is, a, where, where their version of Europe is all about innocence, um, innocence. That Russia is innocent. For example, Russia is innocent of homosexuality, which is not a factual claim, of course. But Russia is innocent in, since 2013. Russia has been um, projecting a, a Eurasian ideal, according to which Russia is the center of a kind of innocent European civilization, and Europe is the center of an aggressive European civilization. And the reason why this works in Russia is that it, 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 it's, it's, is, is the notion that we, the innocent ones, are under attack. The reason why it works is the politics of inevitability is if you can't reform the state because the people who engineered the radical inequality are the same people who control the state, right? And that makes reform not only impossible but literally unthinkable. Then you have to change the conversation of politics from, from interests or social advance to, to, to virtue and, and enmity. And once you have done that, it can't just be domestic policy, it has to be foreign policy as well. So Russia really is interested, and this makes perfect sense, by the way, in the, from their point of view, in the disintegration of the European Union. Um, now, the, the, the way, though, that, that, that Russian policy can apply to Europe, or have some traction in Europe, again, has to do with the soft spot. And I've, I think I've already explained why. Um, if, if you're thinking about, I mean, there are people who know much more about this than me, but if you're thinking about Brexit, like, Brexit is actually not a concept, right? Like, there's, there's not, there, I, there, there will not be Brexit. You know, why will not be Brexit, you ask? Because there will either not be an exit or there won't be Britain, right? I mean, the whole, the whole notion of a British exit, I think, is almost unthinkable. Either they won't go at all, which is my personal opinion, but if they do go, they will very quickly not be Britain, 
Now, why does that, does that sound surprising? The reason why I don't think there'll be a Britain is that there's never been a Britain, so why should there ever be a Britain? No, why should there ever be, why should there be a Britain? There has never been a Britain. There was a British empire for a really long time, and then since the early 70s, there has been the participation of Britain in a larger European process of integration. But what there has never been is a Britain, so why should there be? Right? And there's even less reason to think that there should be one since the architects of Brexit are not thinking about this in the radical conceptual terms that they would have to. What they're thinking is, we just have to sort out some technical details with the European Union and then there will be Britain. But there has never been a Britain, so why should there be a Britain? Right? I, do not believe there will, I do not believe there will be a Britain. Anyway, the whole idea of Brexit contains two categories which are not nearly as solid as they seem to be. Right? This is all just another way of making the same point that I was trying to make before. The soft spot, the one that populists modern populist, contemporary politics, po populists exploit in domestic politics is the common belief that there was a nation state in the past when there wasn't, right? Um, and then the Russians in supporting these populists are just fixing on to a soft spot, just like they fix on to a soft spot in, in the United States. There are domestic sources of the politics of eternity in the West, and then there's a country, Russia, which just happens to be further along in the politics of eternity, much more comfortable in it, and has the technical means to, to export it. So I think that's where we are, which brings me to what I want to say about history and, and, and tyranny. Now, there, there are a lot of things a historian could say about all this. One of them is that the 1930s were not good. Right? Um, so, no, no, I mean, it is, isn't it interesting how much nostalgia there is for the 1930s if we just stop it, explicit or implicit? I mean, the idea that our presidential motto is America first is a striking thing, right? America first means the United States and Nazis have more in common with each other than they, than they, than they have differences, and the, the Americans and Nazis should be on one side of a great walled system in which the brown and black people are on the other side. That's what Lindbergh says, and you, and you can hear you know, Lindbergh echoed in, in, I guess Bannon wrote it, but in the inaugural address. It's striking that, um, that France and Britain, are, that, that, that many people in France and Britain are thinking of an implicit 1930s when they imagine that there was a nation state before the complications of the Second World War. It never happened, of course, but, but it's there. It is striking that Russia has actually rehabilitated one of the most, I think he's interesting. I mean, real philosophers, I think, disagree, but um, has, has, has rehabilitated one of the more interesting fascist thinkers of the 1930s. I mean, rehabilitated in the sense of dug up the body from Switzerland and brought it back, right? taken the archives from Michigan State and brought them back, um, citing him in all of the major addresses, sending copies of his books to every bureaucrat in the administration as a Christmas present, um, recommending him to school children, and so on and so on and so on. It is very striking how the 1930s have come back, right? which is a whole different subject. Like We've lost the personal memory of it. And also notice there isn't that much history of it. There's a lot of history of the Second World War, of the Holocaust. But how many, like, you, you, you'll, you'll correct me, but how many books did you read which actually pick out the 1930s, right? The 1930s, that, that particular decade. Okay. But, so a historian can say the 1930s were bad. I spent my career saying the 1930s were bad. I'm going to stop doing it now. And what instead I'm going to try to do is develop a couple of closing thoughts about how history can get us out of this. So when I said history can create time, what did I mean? One thing I meant is that history can relativize other forms of looking at the world. So a historian looking at this politics of inevitability, politics of eternity thing, can, can you know, make clever arguments like I've tried to make. But a historian can also say, look, this politics of eternity, politics of inevitability thing is a historical development and one that we have seen before. The first globalization of the late 19th century also generated a politics of inevitability in the form of liberalism and socialism. It also then generated the politics of eternity in the form of fascism and national socialism. We have seen exactly this dialectic before, which is bracing because it means we know where it can go, right? It can go to two world wars and a Great Depression. It can go to genocide and Holocaust. We know that. But it's also bracing in a different sense, that it gives us a place to stand, that history is the thing which allows us to take distance on these ideas and say, these are, distance in our, these are ideas in our own moment, but they're not ideas which we have to hold. Um, that we can see them as ideas, and, and therefore, the moment we see them as ideas, we may be able to take some, some action. Now, um, what, 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 how, what would action consist in? Well, it begins, I think, with, with recognizing patterns 
if you can see the time skates themselves, you don't have to use you know, my words or even accept these concepts, but if you can see the concepts, the timescapes themselves, if you can see them, right, as, as opposed to living within them, then you're beginning to empower yourself. If you're inside the politics of inevitability, the danger is that you personally shift to the politics of eternity, right? Which happens in a couple of ways. The first way is that you face dramatic, stupefying, disempowering inequality, and a story of progress no longer makes sense, and you fall into a different kind of story, one of, one of cycles. But it can also happen if you're shocked, and I mean this very seriously now, what happened to a lot of Americans in 2016 was that they were shocked, and they went from saying everything's going to be fine to everything's going to be disastrous. And either way, as citizens, there was no particular reason to exercise agency. Um, you know, when, uh, talking about this book at Harvard, I'm going I'm to say Harvard, could, could, could have been Yale. Talking about the book at Harvard to a bunch of undergraduates, I said, you guys you know, thought in October that everything was going to be great and therefore you could go work on Wall Street. And now you think everything's going to be terrible and therefore you can go work on Wall Street. Right? <laughs> and they all laughed and nodded. And that's what I'm talking about. That you can, that's the other way that you slip, right? That you, one personally slips. The shift is not an abstract slip, ship, slip, people slip. And the question is that you, how, how you stop yourself from slipping. And one of the ways is to recognize these patterns, the big ones and the small ones. I won't belabor all the ways that 2016 was reminiscent of the 1930s. But if one has these examples in mind, one can see them, one can catch them, and then one can, one can, one can, catch, one can catch oneself. Okay, which, which, brings me to the way, which brings me to On Tyranny, which is this little political pamphlet, which you know, I didn't want to talk too much about. But I'm going, to conclude, I'm going to close just by talking about the very first lesson. So the book On Tyranny, this very, little, this very brief book, which you could have read while I was talking. Um, in fact, that has happened. In fact, I think I see someone in this room who has done that to me before. Um, no, it's a very brief book. It's a very short book. It's not, it's not a history book. It's a pamphlet. It's a pamphlet. It's a normative book. It's a pamphlet. The very first lesson in this book is, is don't obey in advance. Um, do not obey in advance. Why is, why is that the first lesson? It's the first lesson because it's one of the few things that historians of the 1930s in Germany actually agree about. So we don't, in fact, agree about it. That's not even a secret that we don't agree about very much. But historians of the Holocaust disagree about an awful lot. But one of the very few things around which there is earnest agreement is that in the 1930s, especially in 1933, or in the first weeks of months after Hitler came to power in February 1933, it mattered a great deal that he received certain forms of consent. Not necessarily marching or voting, but forms of consent like looking away, not removing swastikas from walls, not speaking out, right? Waiting for the general mood and reacting to the general mood. Th that turns out to be much, much more important than very smart people understood in, in 1933. We, the converse of that is that little gestures, provided that they're made at the beginning of the transition, have an awful lot of political weight. One way to think about this is morally, that if you are that person that acts at the beginning, then you remain the person who acts at the beginning. If you make it an excuse not to do something at the beginning, then you become the person who didn't do something at the beginning. And one already sees in American public life the intellectuals and the politicians who now, nine months in, are writing the op-eds which explain why they didn't do anything at the beginning. Right? That's already present in American public life. Politically, actions taken at the beginning are magnified. The long, the, the chan it is actually, it turns out, it, 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 in most situations, it's not that difficult to prevent a regime change provided that action is taken at the very, very beginning. The time that goes by makes, makes nonviolent action, um, which is the kind that I assume most of us hope will prevail, makes nonviolent action less likely to succeed. At the beginning, it has a very serious chance, but the more time goes by, the harder it becomes to practice and the less likely it is to succeed. So for those reasons, the very first lesson of the book is, is don't obey in advance. It's also the first lesson because if you can follow that one, then you'll be able to follow a lot of the other ones. If you can't follow that one for the moral and political reasons that I already mentioned, then the other ones all, all cease to be irrelevant. But the reason why I'm, quote, I'm closing with it is that don't obey in advance is about creating time in the sense about creating moral choice and a sense of moral responsibility. Don't obey in advance is about not shifting from one form from inevitability to eternity.
from, from progress to doom. Don't obey in advance is about seeing yourself in a historical moment. And, and, and seeing oneself in a historical moment is the same thing as seeing how the historical moment can be changed by, by oneself. And it's in that way that I really do honestly, sincerely, and completely earnestly believe that history creates time. Um, it creates the time, the moment of time, the moment of seeing that we need in order to be able to act. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you especially for patience with Iceland. I appreciate that especially. Thank you.